Thank you, Lord, for being who you are. Lives you're touching. Moving in and turning around. We're blessed, God, to be yours today. Thank you for every person whose heart you're doing a work in this morning. Remind us, God, of who we are in you. How wonderful it is just to be called yours. That there is still peace that passes all understanding found in you. Everything is seemingly falling apart. It is you, God, who keeps us together. And we thank you for that. The wonderful name, the powerful name, the always on time name of Jesus. We're so grateful for this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's look around this morning and think about how blessed we really are. So many testimonies around this room. Kelly, it is so good to see you and Isaac here in, in God's house. Jake, it's great to see a whole row of your family here this morning. Victor was sharing with me this morning a great testimony of his son being cancer free this morning. It's great. Some of you who have shared with me that you got promotions on your job or raises. Others who told me you've been laid off, but somehow God's kept you. You know, none of that makes sense on paper. But it's just who He is. That at the moment when you thought everything was going just to fall to pieces, God somehow held you so close you felt peace that was beyond explanation. We're blessed. We're a blessed people. Um, Amy messaged me a little bit ago. She's uh, not going to be able to make it this morning because of uh, illness, but so there won't be any children's church today. You'll be in here with us, but I... Um, I want to deliver you today my heart. I hope to get through this. Of the necessity of having our faith. So that we can see where we're going. In the midst of a time that's just, it's unseeable. It's foggy. We need faith. To enable us to be able to see, amen? Amen. So if you will, just turn with me in your Bible to the book of Luke, or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 9. The book of Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And I know some of you are new to the Bible, and people who have been in church a long time think everybody will know where stuff is. But if you're new to the Bible, Matthew's in the New Testament. If you got a copy of God's Word, it's the first book of the New Testament. So I gave you an easy one this morning. Matthew chapter 9. Thank you, worship team, as always. A wonderful job leading us into God's presence. Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through be on the wall for your convenience, and I always want to say, you know, you can get electronic copies of God's Word, download Bible Gateway or Blue Letter Bible, whatever, it's free access, I encourage you to do that, but if you need a copy of God's Word, a hard copy of God's Word, a tree Bible, be sure to see me, and we'll make sure that you get a copy of God's Word. Matthew 9, 27 through 31, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him. 
crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be it to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. When they departed, they spread the news about him in all the country. Doesn't that sound just like a kid? Don't tell nobody. Aye, aye. You won't believe what I got to tell you. (laughs) Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for this morning again. Thank you for those that are here, maybe visiting with us for the first time, those that are watching online. Lord, speak to their hearts today, us in this room. Challenge us. Change us. God, conform us into the image of your dear son. We love you. We honor you. We give place for you to feed us today and change us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good to have Jeff with us this morning and Justin. So good to see you on. Ethan, is he laying down there? Yeah. Things are just <clears throat> uncertain. Uncertain. Try to think of a word for the last <laughs> 18 months. And probably just uncertainty comes to the top. Uncertain is defined in Scripture as not completely definite about something. Not completely known or missing knowledge. Doubtful. Unsettled. Not clearly identified. Or this last definition, unable to clearly see. Does that not define where we've been? Uncertain. Growing up, I heard phrases when people would try to articulate being uncertain about things. Maybe you've heard some of this. I'm betwixt and between. Anybody ever hear that growing up? It means I just don't know. I'm in a quandary. I'm sitting on the fence. The jury is still out. Things are just a little foggy. My granny used to say, I've lost the thread. That means she didn't know which way to go. I'm of two minds about it. I still got my feelers out. Anybody else grew up hearing that? Things are still up in the air. Or my personal favorite, it's about as clear as mud to me of what I should do. Uncertainty is definitely wearing the crown of the day. There's just so many strands being woven into what makes the tapestry of the life that we're living in. It's really not that we don't want to take steps forward. It's not that we don't want to move like we know we're supposed to move. But truth be told, we just don't know what steps to take. We don't know what path is the best one laid out in front of us. And every path seems to have its own obstacles and challenges. And so uncertainty then kind of crushes or collapses in on us. And it causes us not to walk in every area of life. It's just firing in like a rapid fire. On us. One thing we think gets settled, then another thing pops up. So we can't get real clarity on where we should go because it's crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis. Uncertainty. In the midst of it all, nobody seems to have an agreement on anything, and all we know is that we just don't like each other. We just didn't realize it till recently. That in the middle of crisis, we really just don't want to be bothered. We don't want to talk about it. We have uncertainty with our nation. We've learned that things can turn into chaos in a moment. Turn on a dime. You can go to bed one night, wake up the next morning, and see a news report, and the whole world's in turmoil. Depravity, lawlessness, no value of life. We're seeing new depths of humanity in our lifetime. Health and viruses, entire normalcy gets turned on its head. Financially, we've seen things can bottom out just by a couple of people making bad decisions that you don't even know about. In your lifetime, in mine, in the past five years, we've saw most of the European continent go bankrupt. Greece, France, Spain, all of them turning in 
bankruptcies. We've seen the euro that was supposed to be the savior of monetary unit tank. We saw the American dollar lose its value. We've watched our country have a credit rating decrease for the first time in American history. We've seen bailouts and stimulus, and we're just going to give a little bit of this and a little bit here, and Robin Peter to pay Paul, and at the end of the day, they're both poor. 401K is out the window. Retirement's in question. What's it going to look like when you reach 55? What's it going to look like when you reach 60? What is those investments going to be? We've seen real dollar lose any type of value, and now crypto dollar, bitcoins, digital money. Ruling the day. Some with a dog as a mascot and some with whatever else. Based on who hosts Saturday Night Live, the economy goes up and down. We live in weird times. Precarious times. Unsettled times. Uncertain times. We see more division and strife and isolation between family and friends than at any time we can remember. Relationships are strange. Our weather and environments, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, flooding. And it's all happening with lightning speed. One right after the other. I told you this morning in our (coughs) offering for Convoy of Hope, they are literally spread all over the world in crisis, right? real crisis right now. We're very much sailing in uncharted waters. And uncertainty is the cargo that's made its way into each of our ships. Culture seems to have all the answers to offer. Oh, they do. All you got to do is trust the right politician. That will answer everything. If you'll just pick the right party, then everybody will have cake and confetti. Can I tell you that in the history of America, we've had 20 Democratic presidents and 19 Republican presidents, and neither one know how to throw a party. Well, then all you need to do is grab a hold of a good cause. You'll be able to see how to spend your life with certainty if you just get a hold of a good cause. And now, don't hear what I'm not saying. There are a lot of good causes in the world today. I think the Red Cross is a good cause. I Convoy of Hope is a good cause. The right national right to life is a good cause. I, I'm, I'm a part of all of those causes, humanitarian relief causes. There are causes that run a dime a dozen, environmental causes. Don't leave a carbon footprint. PETA has a cause for the Lobster Empathy Center where they want to build a $280,000 center for lobsters who have been rescued out of restaurants. You can join that. The international movement to give personhood protection to plants is a cause. The anti-complexity of the English language group that protests outside of spelling bees. That's a cause. The two girls I saw on the news saying stop killing cows in front of the milk at the back of a Kroger. That's a cause. (laughs) The preservation of the rights of balloons to fly where they please is a cause. The return of the Flat Earth Society that raised over $45 million last year is a cause. If you just join a cause, everything will be all right. I mean, shouldn't balloons be able to fly where they want? Sick of this. Tied to string stuff. Causes from culture can make you feel like you're really doing something, but they don't solve the uncertainty of life. Well, if you can't get certainty from politics and you can't get certainty from causes and you can't get certainty from social justice pushes, then I know what you must do, culture would say. You must just change who you are then. You need to re-identify as someone else because if our two best options don't satisfy you, then you must be the wrong you. Now listen, if you haven't figured it out yet, the crisis we see in rapid-fire growth are pushing us toward an event. The event you don't hear about a whole lot anymore. There's not a whole lot of sermons and teachings, and it's not popular. It doesn't turn YouTube trendy. It doesn't get its own Vimeo. It's not snapped a whole lot. It's pushing us toward an event that everybody used to know, and somehow we've forgotten. Jesus is coming. He's returning. 
the return of Jesus. You say, you really believe that with every fiber of my being. We're biblically checking every box in Jesus' pay attention to this list. Jesus was specific. Not my words, his. In Matthew 24, he said you would see all these things and they would be the beginning of birth pains. What's that mean? You'll see these things coming on. You ever been around a woman who's about to go into labor? She begins to get contractions, birth pains, and you time them. Why do you time them? Because the closer together they get, the closer you are to delivery. And Jesus said, when you start to see these things happening in the world, they are like birth pains. And the closer you see them coming together, the closer we are to the return of the Lord. Have you watched the news? They are close together. Can't catch your breath. The Lord is coming. They're painful, Jesus said. They would be sorrowful. What are they, Pastor? Wars and rumors of wars. Nation against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. Ethnos against ethnos. Meaning what? Ethnicity against ethnicity. You'll see a growing way of life where people hate one another, he said. Betraying one another. Even parents to their children and children to their parents. People will have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power of God. They'll begin to see their love grow cold toward one another. There'll be earthquakes and pestilence that will happen more rapidly on the earth. The seas will roar, he says in Luke 21. And the people will see a roaring and surging of the ocean. And they'll be in turmoil and uncertainty of what to do. My friends, my brothers, my sisters, my family, my friends that are watching this online. We are moving closer to the return of Jesus. And I know it's been preached for a hundred of years, but it still should be preached today. Soon and very soon, we shall see the king. He is coming and returning. What's he returning for? For a bride. One day soon, you and I will be caught up with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's true whether you want it to be or not. He's coming. Uncertainty invades our lives. So, Pastor, what do we do then? Because I'm not part of the crowd who says, well, we should just hunker down and hold the fort till Jesus comes then. We got to live. We got to do something more than just go to church. We got to be the church. We got to live this thing out. Faith has to be lived out in the middle of an uncertain time. The uncertainty of the moment, the uncertainty of the time, the the crisis leaves us foggy. Our externals aren't really clear. Being able to move forward requires the ability to see with certainty. When everything visible is uncertain. And so I thought in prayer, who better to show people how to walk through uncertainty than two people who couldn't see? The two blind men that I read to you in Matthew chapter 9 more than anybody else, should be able to testify to us how to walk when you can't see where you're going. How to move forward when things aren't clear. They're going to live out certainty and uncertainty. Their blindness until they get to their eyes being open should stir up in us a faith like they had. The thing that moves them from being blind in uncertainty to sight with certainty is the substance of their faith. Faith became their eyes. Their eyes of expectancy was rooted in their faith. Your faith. Your faith is the most expensive commodity you own. If your faith is gone, you're done. And right now, I'm I'm with you. I, I hear you. I feel you. I'm walking with all those things. Right now, it's challenging us to give up our faith. I mean, why hold on to it? Everything's going wrong. Everything I thought would turn out this way turns out that way. You can't talk to anybody anymore. You can't, Lord forbid you have a disagreement. You can't post an opinion without being raked over the coals. What maybe was suitable to say a month ago is now will land you in prison. It's uncertain. So why not just quit? 
You know the old saying, if you can't beat them, join them. That's the pressure. Pastor, why do we have to live so different? Why do Christians have to be so stinking different? Because who's alive on the inside of us is different. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There are two different he's, y'all. And as long as that he that's greater is alive on the inside of you, he will never match up with the he that's outside there. They're two separate he's. Faith is what the enemy would like to rob from you. So what does faith see in the middle of uncertainty? How do we know that we're banking on our faith? The first thing I want you to see that I believe the blind men teach us is to get to possible, you got to go past the limit of impossible. We belong to a faith... And we are in relationship with a God who makes doing the impossible part of the character of who he is. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. These two blind men are showing us that you've got to sometimes go past the fence of impossible and follow God all the way to get to possible. Impossible moments are going to continue to be on the menu for our life. I wish I could take them off, but I can't. They are not stop signs to people of faith. You run up to something impossible, that's not a stop sign. That's a keep going sign. God's just on the other side of that impossibility. We've got to get back there again to believing that God is not limited by our impossibilities. They followed behind Jesus as he was leaving the house of a little girl. Do you hear what I said? I want want to repeat that. Two blind men followed Jesus as he left the house. That is an impossible sentence. How do two blind men follow Jesus walking anywhere? If the blind follow the blind, they'll what? Both fall in the ditch. That's what the Bible says. But here you got two blind men. As soon as Jesus walks out of a house, they pick up the trail like two hound dogs following after Jesus. They're walking in impossibility to get to their possibility. The two blind men can't see, but yet they can see what the people around them cannot see. Let me say it this way. The people who should be able to see can't see, and the people who should not be able to see are the only two who can see. Because the people who can see stay back, but the people who can't see say, wherever he goes, I'm going. I'll follow him even through impossibility. They're following him to the limits of impossibility. They're they're saying something. I don't want you to miss this. Even when you can't see where you're going, the mark of a believer should be that we are able to say something even when we can't see something. As they're following him, they begin to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Even though they can't see him, They're saying what they should be saying. Even when they can't see where they're going, what's coming out of their mouth is the right thing to come out of their mouth. Anybody remember this toy growing up? Uh, It was called a see and say. Anybody remember a see and say growing up? I love that toy. Uh, If you've not been introduced to this high-tech technology, uh, what you do is you would... Pull that thing down. I don't think mine had a fancy lever. I think mine had a pull cord. But that arrow would turn around. And whatever it landed on, if it landed on the rooster, it would say, the rooster says, (coughs) you with me? Push it again. Turn around. Land on the turkey. The turkey says, (coughs) it was so cool. 
And when it wouldn't land on the animal you wanted, you could force it to go on the animal you wanted. Stop that arrow midstream and say, no, I want to hear the dog. I'm tired of hearing the pig. It always done the pig. The thing about this toy is that you didn't have to be sitting in front of it to see where it was going to land. The cool thing about it was you could be in the next room over and you knew what it landed on, not because you saw it, but because you heard it. Be sitting in a whole other room and the little kid pulled that thing down and all of a sudden the frog says, ribbit, ribbit. And you knew that thing was pointing dead at a frog. I wonder if believers today, when the Holy Spirit points at us in the middle of a culture that is uncertain and doesn't know which way to go, I wonder what we've been caught saying. Do we say that our faith is anchored in Jesus, come what may, or are we wishy-washy about uncertainty of I don't know if we should trust this, or I don't know if we should go here, or I don't know if we should be with them, I don't know if we should listen to her, or is it when the Holy Spirit says, wait a second, in the middle of the cloudiness, right here as a believer, a follower of Jesus, are we like a spiritual see and say that says the believer says, Lord, have mercy on us, and I'm trusting you to walk through impossibility. Two blind men, the two blind men said, Lord, have mercy on us. If I'm going to follow you, Jesus, in this uncertain time, more than anything else in my life, I need your mercy. Is there anyone this morning that would agree with me that one of the best things God ever gave to you is his mercy? Can I let you in on a little secret? You need it every day. How do you know, Pastor? Because he said his mercies are brand new every morning. I need mercy. Mercy, God. I need mercy. It's saying I have broken pieces. I have incomplete abilities, and I need the mercy of God. I'm following him, and it's hard to do sometimes, but in that following, I need mercy. I want you to look at what they did. We're just having a story time this morning. They are willing to follow him all the way. The Bible says, I read to you, and when he come into the house, the blind men came to him. They followed him when he left this house. And they walked right in to that house. That's cooler than the other side of the pillow. Let me tell you why. Because in Middle Eastern culture, you don't go into a house unless you're invited. And you take off your shoes when you get in there. You don't go into a house unless you're invited. I love these two blind men because they say, if he's going in there, I'm not going to do anything that's considered normal. If he goes... I go, because he's the only one able to take care of my impossibilities. And the second thing they show us is you you and I have got to use our outside and inside voice. On the outside, they're following him, asking him for mercy. They follow him into the house, and Jesus looks at them and says, do you believe I'm able to do this? Now, I want you to notice something with me. They never ask him to heal their sight. Not one time. But we serve a God who in his mercy knows what we have need of before we ever ask or think about what we have need of. When you ask God for mercy, he gives you what's on your mind, but God's so good he gives you what's on your mind plus ten. They follow him in. I can see them in my mind. You know I'm a weirdo. i got to see things like a movie. I see these two blind men stumbling in. I don't know if they have sticks or what they got. don't matter. They get into the house, and they're feeling around in the living room, and they know he's there because they can hear a little bit of where he is. And as soon as Jesus turns around, he looks at them and says, you believe I can do this? Now, they didn't ask for nothing but mercy. And what's their answer? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, we believe you can do this. Now, this is amazing because let me tell you why. This is the first time in the book of Matthew that anyone is healed of blindness. This is the first time in the New Testament 
Blindness is healed. Up until this point, they've not seen anyone blind be able to see. And so when he said, do you believe I can do this? Their immediate response was, yes, Lord. How is it that they believe that? How is it that they believe he can do that? Because you've got to read the first part of Matthew chapter 9 to figure out what's going on. In the first part of Matthew 29, Jesus is walking, minding his own business, and suddenly a man comes to him and says, Teacher, my daughter is at home, very, very sick. She's about to die. This man's name is Jairus. And Jesus says, I will go. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to touch this little girl. I'm going to heal her. And as he's making his way down the road, if you know your Bible, you know what happens. Suddenly, out of the crowd, there's a woman who is pushing her way through the crowd. She's an unclean woman. She has an issue of blood, meaning what? Her body just keeps profusing blood, and it's been doing it for 12 years. And she's crawling and pushing, and she doesn't want anybody to see who she is. And she gets to Jesus, and you know the wonderful sermon that everybody loves to preach. She grabs the hem of his garment, and immediately her blood issue dries up. And Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And she says, it was me, Lord. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. And while he's having this conversation with this woman, and everybody's amazed, somebody comes running from Jairus' house and says, it's over. Don't bother him anymore. It's too late. Your daughter is dead. And immediately, Jesus turns on his heels, looks at Jairus in the eyes, go back and read it, and says, do not doubt, only believe. And they walk to the house. And there's people in there already mourning and frying chicken. And he gets them all out of the house. And he walks up to the upstairs bedroom where the little 13-year-old girl is. He kneels down beside the bed and says, Talitha Kumai, which says, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately a dead girl gets up out of the bed and begins walking around the bedroom. In Matthew 9, 27, when I read to you, it says, and he left that house and two blind men followed him. That was that little girl's house that he's walking out of. So these two blind men said, I heard what you did for the woman with the issue of blood. I was outside the house when you raised a little girl from the dead. And if you can heal a blood issue of 12 years and you can raise a little girl from the dead, our eyes ain't nothing for you. Our faith says, if you say you can do it, Lord, you can do it. What does that say to us? It says to us that, no, I've never seen God handle a culture like we're living in now. I've never seen, I don't read history of when he's had to come in when we don't know what's a male or a female. I've never seen culture when God's had to handle, when we don't know how to treat one another or have a conversation or care for one another. I've never seen him, but I know if he done it then and he done it yesterday, then God is certainly able to do it today. Well, I don't know. I've never read that he can do that. You ever read that he couldn't? You ever read a battle God couldn't win? I certainly haven't. I think that same faith needs to rise up in us. That says, I know what you did when you left that house. And if you're in this house, I'm ready for you to do the impossible in this house. I remember uh, a, a, a couple years ago, I preached a sermon. And I shared with you uh, that sometimes watching movies, I get a sermon out of a movie. And I was watching at the time The Lion King. Remember this sermon I told you? And it's when Mufasa appears to Simba and says, remember who you are. Oh, oh, remember that? And I said, we need to hear the Father pronounce over us again to remember who we are. I'm not going to re-preach that. But I got a, I got a 2.0 to it watching a movie this last week in quarantine. Anybody seen Black Panther, the superhero movie? Oh, it's good. It's better than butter beans. This is the late Chadwick Boseman. He plays the Black Panther or King T'Challa. He is in, a, uh, in an odd space because... His dad has died. His dad was the king or the ruler of Wakanda. And now he, the prince, T'Challa, 
is about to take on the mantle of being the Black Panther. But the thing is, is that when you're receiving this, somebody can challenge you for the role. And there's a man that comes down and challenges him called Mbaku, and he's going to challenge him. He leaves the Jajuri people. He wants to challenge T'Challa for the crown. And they're just fighting, just, you know, kicking the guts out of one another on this waterfall. And it looks like the Black Panther's about to lose. I mean, this other dude, he, he is a big guy. He's done head-butted him and knocked him senseless, kicked him, stabbed him, played dirty. He's about to kill him. And he's laying kind of back like this, and he's like that. I mean, he's got him in his arms. He's crushing the life out of him, and King T'Challa is just. But he's got a mama in the crowd. And his mama, her name is Queen Ramonda. Put her picture up there. She takes care of business. And when everybody else is like this, oh, God. <laughs> Queen Ramonda, the mama, steps up in the movie. She pushes her daughter, the princess, a little bit behind her. And she says, show them who you are. Oh, I love it, man. I jumped out of the recliner. Woo, yes. I felt that, Lord. She says, show them who you are. And she says it so loud and so forceful. And then you know how they do in Hollywood. They, they play it in slow motion again as he's in like. And then you hear her words, show them who you are. Like that. And it's like a little bit of life just kind of returns to him. His eyes get back straight. He raises back up out of the headbutt. Now this time, M'Baku looks scared to death, and he should be. And he just squalls. He goes, ah! I am T'Challa, Prince of Wakanda. And he just, go, I mean, just beats the stuffings out of this guy. Goes completely wild. Has him down in a chokehold, about to throw him over the waterfall. And he says, tap. Yeah. In a moment, the script flipped. Not because he was any stronger in that moment than he was before. But because a mama stepped out of the crowd and said, D you're not acting like who you are. Show them who you are. And that breathed something back into him to say, I am not defeated. I am not beneath. I am not less than. I am not forgotten. I am not a history mark. I am the prince of Wakanda and church. It hit me so hard. I think in 2020 we did the Simba thing. We tried to remember who we were. Remember you're not forgotten. Remember who you are. But now the world needs the church to show them who you are. We are not beneath. We are not below. We are not to be forgotten. We're not to be trifled with. We are the bride of Jesus Christ with his blood flowing through our veins. We have power. We have presence. We have forgiveness. We have healing. We have, we have everything available at Calvary. Whatever he says, that's who we are. And I, for one, am tired of being told what I should believe. I know who I am in Jesus. And it's time to show who you are. Enemies attacking your family, show him who you are. When he's persecuting you for your faith, show him who you are. When he's packing up your peace, about to walk out of your house with it, show him who you are. I'm not giving up. Why? Because I'm the one who's seen God do the impossible. I'm one who has seen God do the unthinkable. And I will not get to this place when it is the hardest and give up. So, I'm not telling you to walk around in a self-made strut. Nope. I'm telling you to walk in a sanctified swagger. That I know who I am in Jesus. And even in the midst of impossibility, my God can make it possible. 
Jesus put his hands. I feel good, man. I'm telling you, I feel real good. This is still what he does. It's still what he does. Let me finish the story because I know I don't want your supper at home to become a burnt offering. The thing is that I know the last part we kind of forget. And it's something that we read the woman with the issue of blood. We read the girl being raised from the dead. And for the life of me, we always forget these two blind men's story. It comes right after it. He puts his hands on their eyes in the story. You say, and? Remember, this is the first time this happened in New Testament. Blind eyes in the Bible times were not appealing. It was because of infection and the scorching heat that typically the infection would set in and the blindness would come, not at birth. It could come at birth, but you got to remember over 35% of the Middle Eastern world is blind because infection sets in. And the eyes give way to infection. Balls of flies would gather. And so a lot of times you'll see in movies where they head wrap around blind men's eyes, that's because to keep the grossness out of public view. And the Bible says, Jesus didn't touch him on the forehead or on the shoulder. He put his hands on their eyes. And he still does that today. The thing that is the most broken and unappealing place of your life. He's still not afraid to touch that. And said, according to your faith. This is cool. Everywhere else Jesus did a miracle with the exception of four places. He did it so that people would get faith. Here, he did it because they had faith. Their faith became their eyesight of expectancy. And he touched them. And the Bible says immediately their eyes were opened. (laughs) You say, Pastor, it just seems so hard to know how we're going to get through this. How in the world are we going to push through this happening in my family, happening in my job, happening in my finances, happening in my health. You're going to walk through impossibility to get to the possible touch of Jesus. That's what we're going to do. Expectation, I say. As they come to the music, not because I don't have more to say, but because we're out of time. Expectation. I, I thought about that. I preached on expectation. The last time I preached on expectation, been a long time. I went back and looked through some of my messages, and it was the week that Mason had his stroke. I had a picture, paper clip to that message of Major wearing a sign called, I'm expecting to the hospital, from that sermon that morning. We expected, and look here, expectancy. I, I thought, Lord, how is it that we can show Simple expectancy, because I think we all kind of know what expectancy is, but how do we live expecting? It needs to become natural for us to be expectant. Couldn't come up with nothing. Saved my life. I thought, man, I just don't know how to explain that. I went out in the garage last night to get something to drink. Our refrigerator is out there. It has drinks in it. And um, I saw, because we still got stuff in boxes where we moved. Where we moved in November, snowstorm, COVID, COVID part two, COVID part three, four, five, all that. So we still got boxes. We've had yard sales, but we just couldn't sell that yard for nothing. So all kinds of boxes. And I got me a lemonade out. I looked over at a box. On top of that box was a Batmobile. About that big is a cool one. It was Noah's when he was little. 
And I don't know how we've held on to that Batmobile, but we did. Now, no, nobody rolls it no more. It's not played with anymore. You get sad when your kids get older and they don't play with their toys anymore. You kind of know how Woody and Buzz felt in Toy Story. And it came to me. Do you know I fixed that Batmobile? That's right. I did. Noah played rough with it. Isaiah had it when he was little. I think he got it for his birthday, passed it down to Noah. Noah loved that thing. Batman was his jam. He had a Batman castle and Batmobile and Batplane, Batcopter and all that. I don't know where they are. But he would roll the Batmobile out of his room and down the stairs into the kitchen part. <clears throat> this Batmobile was cool because it had all kinds of gadgets and missiles that would pop out of it. And one of the coolest things about it is you could put Batman in the driver's seat inside the Batmobile and you push a button and the, the driver's seat would slide out the side of the Batmobile and pop back with missiles out of it. I mean, it was pretty, it was cool. They don't make them like that anymore. I played with it. <laughs> and um, I stood there with my lemonade, and I remembered the Lord was so good to me to let me remember this about expectancy. Because he broke that seat that, that slides out. And he brought it to me. Now, he was probably four. And I remember him come running in the room. Real concerned look on his face. He had the, the seat and the Batmobile, and he needed me to fix it. And I thought, how in the world am I going to fix this? There was a bunch of little parts, springs. But I did it. But do you know, when he brought me the Batmobile and the broken seat, do you know what he did next? He ran back to his room, pitter-patter little feet. And he came back holding Batman in his hand. And he leaned on my leg. You know how kids do? His little back foot just twitching, watching me fix the seat. And the Lord brought that back to my remembrance that as a four-year-old, he stood there in expectancy. Because he knew he had took what was broken to his dad. And that sometime soon, Batman was getting back in the seat. And he stood there with Batman as evidence that he believed I could fix what was broken. I didn't know, I didn't even think about that at the moment until last night holding the lemonade. And I'm telling you, we have a lot broken right now. <laughs> Let's just say what the world's broke. Run off the rails. I don't even know we know what a train is anymore. I'm gonna live with expectant eyesight. I'm going to take what's broken, give it to the Father, and stand there with my spiritual Batman and say, I know any minute, God, you're going to fix this. It's going to run again. And even if everything else falls apart around me, I know in whom I have believed. And my life is secured in the shelter of your wings. And so, God, before you fix what's broken all over the world, fix what's broken in me. Give me the faith of two blind men of Matthew 9. That even if I've never seen you do it this way before, my faith tells me you can. And you will. And I'll follow you from house to house if I have to through impossibility if I have to. I'll use my outside voice and my inside voice. I'll ask for mercy. I don't care who hears me asking you for it. And I'll keep asking until I hear you talk back to me. Here I am, Lord. Fix me. Fix me, Jesus. This morning, if you are here or you're watching, either one, and you don't have a real 
relationship with Jesus. Hear me when I say that. I'm not talking about a religious relationship. I don't care how well you keep a ceremony or how well you attend church and all. No, 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 no. I'm talking about a real relationship because I'm telling you the time is not coming. The time is now when a real relationship is a necessity to make it. What, what's fixing to happen this coming Monday through Saturday is more than you're able to bear on your own. You say, what, what's going to happen? Your guess is as good as mine. But given the last weeks we've been through, it ain't good. I need him. You need him. Is there anyone today who says, yes, that's me. I am ready to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender to him. I want that same God you talked about, preacher, in the Bible who's able to touch my life and touch the places that nobody else wants to even look at. Come on. I want to be saved. I want to know that I belong to Him. I want a brand new life. I want to be His. If that's you, come on. Don't leave here like you walked in. That's what the blind man teaches. Don't leave the house that he's in the same way you walked into the house. He's here. Oh, he's here. I I know he's here. Come on. Surrender to him today. Here's what I'd like for us to do to finish our time together this morning. I'd just like for everybody who is physically able, would you stand right there where you're at?